Hi. Um, I'm a member of the Temecula Valley Astronomers. Uh, our club is open to everybody. The uh, common goal among everybody, you don't have to be an astronomer, you don't even have to have a telescope, but what unites us is our club's mission, and that is to bring, to promote astronomy in our community. And through doing that, we're also promoting science. And what that looks like, uh, we give technical advice. Our president, Mark Baker, for example, is working with uh, Murrieta schools to try to help them build two observatories. Um, we give a lot of presentations. I'll be giving a couple presentations to school groups this month. We also do, probably the most important thing we do is we have what we call star parties, where all of our members, we show up at a public institution or a school or something like that, and we set up our telescopes for typically school children, but we also do these for the general public. And each year, I guess, I, I always mean to keep a count, but I never quite do it well, but I guess anywhere between 1,000 to 3,000 school children actually look through our telescopes. And one of our club members, who probably has done that more than anyone else in our club, took this photograph. He now does a lot of imaging, as we call it. It's, it's photography. The, he, this is a supernova remnant that you're looking at, a star that blew up uh, tens of thousands of years ago. And um, this thing here um, is uh, actually going to be directly overhead about the time this program ends. And so if you go outside around 7 o'clock tonight, assuming the neighboring lights permit it, and look straight up, uh, just know that it is there. You won't actually be able to see that. <laughs> you won't see that supernova remnant unless you have a telescope. Uh, but the reason I, I bring this one up that you can't see, that this is the type of object that we lose sight of first if, as a community, we lose sight of our lighting. Now, about 20-some years ago, Riverside County implemented a lighting ordinances for this area for the purpose of protecting Palomar Observatory. And that has worked. That observatory is still operating, and our skies are a little darker than they would be without that. Well, about 15 years ago, I was, off, I was actually living in San Diego at the time, and that's when I took up astronomy. And about that time, I was offered a job in Temecula. And I thought, oh, that's just great, because I'm going to go up and piggyback off of these lighting restrictions so that I'll always be able to do my hobby in this community. However, today, if you go to Palomar Observatory and take a long-term photograph, and so that's what this is. This is a photograph taken at the observatory looking toward us, the Temecula Valley. And um, by taking it for about five minutes, it, it, it exaggerates the amount of light that you see, but that gives you an idea of what the astronomy community has to put up with, an ever-growing light presence. And unless I forget to say this, I'm not objecting to use of light, I'm only going to be objecting to the design of light. Uh, this particular example here, the fact that all of that light is going up in the sky, that's light that's missing the ground. It essentially comes down to bad aim. This picture here is about the same as going into a community and you see all this water running down the gutter into the drain because it missed the lawn. That's, that's the analogy to think of with this. Now, I wanted to bring in a poorly designed light to show you how annoying they are, but that would only annoy everybody. So I'm going to appeal to a very common experience, and that is you're driving down the highway at night and you see the distance headlights of approaching car. Well, what do you do? If you have your high beams on and you continue to shine those high beams, we agree that this is a bad scenario because the other person doesn't see. Well, what you do is you lower it, you give them their low beams, it's a courtesy, and they in return uh, extend their low beams to you, and we all agree that this is safer. Now, despite the ever-growing amount of light, the fact that this is a habit and is expected and is a commonly known courtesy gives me hope that we can do the same thing with our night lighting. Now, many of our buildings are essentially lit as though they have their high beams on. And considering the uh, maximum velocity of your average building, it's just not necessary for these buildings to be shining lights way across the valley. Anyway, that is the light that contributes most to that glow that we see above our cities that crowds out the view of the stars. And so I'm arguing that it's purely a bad aim at work here. So here is a classic profile of any light. This light could be any particular color. It could be a variety of fixtures. But uh, a poorly designed light is not completely getting all of the light onto the ground. And a certain amount of that goes straight out at the audience and creates glare. I actually have a very good appreciation of that with our, our room lights. And a certain amount of it goes up into the sky that has no practical use whatsoever and just brightens the sky. Well, the goal of any kind of a light, if you could just cut off the worst parts of a light, 
then you'd have all a good light. And so if you put like a reflective fixture, you actually get more light onto the area that you need to see and less of the glare and less of the light pollution. And so that basic design makes lights more effective, more pleasant. It actually makes you safer in, in the, uh, when you're working underneath them. Now, um, uh, again, the goal of light is to hit the earth. And considering how big the Earth is, it's amazing how many lights miss. Here's a light that really misses. And now this is the same thing as shining a bright light in someone's face and say, look out for the crack in the sidewalk, all right? And the reason I like to highlight this one is that the street address that an ambulance driver or a first responder of any kind would use to confirm that they got the right house is actually in shadow while that person is getting glare. So having a light on doesn't necessarily make you safer. It's all about the design of the light. Now here's a light that is very effective at lighting the driveway. This is all good. But right now I'm using a tree for a shield that should be actually on the light and isn't on the light. Now as soon as I come behind that from out behind that tree, I'm getting a face full of glare. And as a driver, right now, I am a hazard to anyone that may be walking in the street, any child on a skateboard, anyone zipping by the sidewalk uh, on a bicycle. And it is just merely the fact that light misses much of its target that causes the problem. And here's an example of a light that we in the light advocacy community call a glare bomb. It's just this big bright thing going off in the dark, but notice the shadow it creates. There is that person in that shadow, and you can't see that person because because the strong shadows are created by the light. So here's a picture taken with a flash cube, lights up the person. It's the kind of thing you would not see if you assume that brighter is always better. So uh, by the time we add many of these lights to our buildings, we essentially got this unnecessary glow. And any kind of a lighting task can be done well. As in the case of this particular house, you can see well. In the case of this business, you could actually count the bricks on those walls. You can see much better because they're directing their light downward. And here's a tale of two uh, car dealerships. Um, <laughs> car dealerships, are allowed to use white light because they need it for color recognition. However, these photographs were taken at like midnight after they've closed, and I don't think it was their intention to have me come over and pick out a color of the right color. So uh, one of the car dealerships, after they close, they use more Palomar friendly lighting, and I think that they're having, well, they're definitely having a less impact on the sky, I bet they're getting the same benefit uh, that the other dealership is getting at less the energy costs, which I hope they pass on to their customers. Uh, anyway, why should we care about Palomar Observatory, for example? A code officer once asked me, uh, I didn't think they used Palomar, he said, uh, now that they have the Hubble Space Telescope. And that's an easy uh, misunderstanding to have. Actually, it's a very valuable scope. Uh, it gets used 363 days a year, and it actually gets tours. Uh, by 2009, they were getting over 100,000 visitors a year touring that observatory. And let's compare it to the Hubble Space Telescope. These are two photos, one by Palomar, one by Hubble. Uh, the Hubble one is darker because it's in space. But if you look at the uh, pinpoints of those stars, the Palomar Telescope actually has better image quality because you can actually see finer detail. You see a smaller star. And that's because it's got a bigger scope. It's a bigger mirror. And so um, it, it it's still a very valuable scope, uh, in many ways better than the ones we have in space. One of the reasons is, is that it's a lot easier to add a new instrument by trucking it up the mountain than to blast it into space. And here's a, another photo, a great accomplished by Palomar Observatory, of planets around another star, all right? Of the 800 planets discovered around other stars, most of those are inferred based on data. Palomar is one of the few observatories that has actually created image of planets around another star. So that's cutting edge science being done right here in America in our backyard. And now a more practical application of Palomar, uh, an asteroid was discovered in the year 2030 and it was calculated that it would pass between the Earth and the Moon in, actually in 1997, but in 2030 it would pass between the Earth and the Moon. Well, once they knew generally where it was, they could go around to observatories and say, hey, did any of you photograph this thing? Uh, and once Palomar knew what to look for, they actually had photographs of it from 1990 and were able to better calculate the orbit. And it looks like a clean miss in, the 20, in 2030. So anyone looking forward to 2030 has Palomar to thank for that. Anyway, <laughs> the ordinances that we have had have worked. This is the Milky Way in my backyard, and I'm using the Milky Way as a standard of what it is I'm trying to save. If we can save Palomar, we also save this view of the Milky Way in all of our backyards. And I think if you could walk out in the backyard and actually look up and have an opportunity to go, hey, what's that little fuzzy thing? I think that's a much more rich and rewarding life. Now, I'm not trying to make it 
as spectacular as it would be in the desert. We're not trying to say no lights or anything like that. It will always be better out there in the desert. But the dimmer our cities are as far as their upward light, the less distance you have to go to, to, to see something like that. Now, uh, the real point, uh, besides even Palomar, the real important feature that I see it is, again, our club does community outreach. Our president, Mark Baker, has been working with the Murrieta schools to get them to use two telescopes that they already have. And these telescopes that they have are actually research quality telescopes. Uh, we're just, they just need some help knowing what to do with them. And, and with these telescopes, students in our community could actually contribute real data to astronomy projects. And what do you call a student who actually submits real data? You call that person an astronomer. And so that's an opportunity we can be giving our students here, whether they started in their backyard or whether they started at their schools. And so there's always going to be so many competing things for their attention. Uh, I don't want to take away the night sky. I don't want to remove that as one of those opportunities for them to explore. And, and next week, I'm going to be giving a presentation to uh, a school group. And in all my presentations, I can usually answer most of the questions. But then I always get a question that says, where I just have to say, I don't know. And then the teacher comes out at me and I say, why don't you look that one up yourself? You know, I want to say, why don't you become the astronomer and answer that one for me? And I want to be able to tell them the sky is the limit. But uh, we control how limiting their sky will be. And there is something that you can do. Remember, our community does have ordinances. They just need a little bit of a wake-up call and a little bit of an exercise. We just need to go to our planning department meetings. We need to go to our city councils and say, hey, it's not just some abstract thing that's trying to save astronomers. We want more efficient lighting. We want better design in our lighting. We want to remove glare. And in doing that, we'll have less light pollution and a more beautiful uh, night sky. So it's like a win-win situation. Thank you.